38.6 million people living with it worldwide. AIDS kills. Use a condom and prevent it. Okay, round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Edwin and Derek, come on up. Take the stage. It's all yours. That Welcome. was great. Welcome. Who did that? Raise your hand, group two. That's cool. The reason why I liked it is because it was drawn out, and, and, it, and it's like, you know, the human condition, the earth, everything is a growing process, and it hasn't been filled in yet, and I dig that. I thought that was very cool. Hi, guys. Hi. How you doing? You know, I love the idea that you're all high school students, because I didn't know that I could be a filmmaker when I was your age. I didn't know that it was even possible. Did you know, Eddie? No. Nope. Nope, actually, you, you guys probably have a head start on, on, on us. Um, I got involved in, in the arts in general when I, uh, I was a young kid at the, the boys' clubs. Um, I grew up on, in the South Bronx uh, in an area, uh, 174th and Southern Boulevard, and we had Madison Square Boys and Girls Club uh, about a block away. And when I was around 12, um, uh, I became a member of the boys' club, and they had a... a uh, art department in the sub basement, more or less like here, it's uh, downstairs, and it was a little bit underutilized. They had um, a department to do wood shop, they had a, a kiln, so they had pottery making. But there was one room that always caught my attention, it was a, a dark room off to the side as soon as you came out of the art department. And um, initially when I, I would go by, I would always look in, there would be two or three students there with the art director learning photography. And I would always go by, peek in, but I would never stop in. Most of the time, I was really going into the, uh, the area where they had the clay so that we can take some clay and then pelt each other upstairs with the clay. So it was really about going downstairs to steal the clay and having sort of a clay fight with my friends. And one day, I stood by the door a little too long by the, the dark room, and Ernesto Lanzano, who was the art director and actually became my mentor, got me into the arts, said, well, you just can't stand there. You're either going to come in or you got to go upstairs. And I remember feeling a little like taken aback. And I didn't, you know, I was younger. I was very respectful of my elders. So I went in for a few minutes. Um, and the class was almost at end. But I found it quite intriguing uh, that they were taking uh, this paper, putting it on an easel, turning off the lights, leaving this red safety light on. And after putting the, pa the paper in a couple of uh, chemicals, an image would come up. I had never realized how. Uh, photographs were developed, how they were printed at all. So I, I was intrigued. Um, but it, it, it wasn't for a couple of months later that I actually came back and started attending the, uh, the classes there. Uh, but once I started doing it, I was hooked. Um, and fortunately and unfortunately, as I kept going, less students over time started taking the classes. So for a period of about three years, I basically was the only one that had access to the darkroom and was really, really was able to develop my craft as a photographer during those years. And as you can imagine, growing up in the South Bronx uh, in the late 80s, I mean, early 80s, um, you know, the, the, the Bronx uh, was a much different place than it is today. So for me, the one thing that I found really intriguing growing up at that time uh, was the fact that, you know, I, I saw the community around me as a very exotic place. Um, started uh, learning about other photographers and photo photojournalists and what they were doing overseas and in war. But I always got the hint that there was, you know, it was just as interesting in my backyard as what I was seeing in the picture books uh, by other famous photographers in other countries and in other places outside New York. So I started documenting my own community, uh, particularly people. Uh, I worked a lot photographing young people in the streets, people your age, people my age at that time, um, and, you know, de developed a portfolio. Uh, probably in my fourth year of really being involved in photography, at that time I was around 17, probably going on 18, um, Ralph Porter, who was the director of the Madison Avenue Clubhouse, uh, said that there was an opportunity to take some classes at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, it wasn't uh, an ongoing program, but it was probably something of upwards of three months. It was like a small scholarship to take some film courses. So I, I went, and the first course was directing, and it had a lot to do with numbers, so it totally freaked me out because I wasn't very good with math. Um, so I avoided that, that class <laughs> very much. Uh, but the class that did catch, again, that was, caught my attention was the cinematography class. I already was uh, aware of photography and, 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 and how to expose and, and frame shots. So that one kind of became very quickly something that I got involved in. And, um, and from there, I just kept going, uh, you know, 
kind of doing video at, at that time. They were called uh, Porta Packs. Video was just coming in. So we started doing a lot of community organizing and videotaping of events that were going on in the community. And just kept from there developing my craft as a cinematographer uh, and later much on as a writer, et cetera. But I want, I want to give Derek a, a shot here to just kind of fill in some of the, the how he got years. into the early years of how he got involved. And then we'll continue on from there. I, uh, I dropped out of school at 16. I was one of those kids that was more interested in being cool and hanging out with my friends and partying than doing anything, you know, with my life. And I certainly didn't enjoy doing homework or paying attention, you know. So I started working and, you know, life has its issues and, you know, things come up and I started out of nowhere writing poetry. Now, my best classes were always like history, and, and, and I would make up stories in English. I never read the book, you know, but I would make up a story and get like a B, which was always good enough for me. And uh, uh, I just started writing poetry. And it felt good, because I was able to express whatever was going on in my personal life, you know, if I was unhappy dealing with my family, my brother, or whatever the case is, I would end up writing about it. Didn't intend to, but I would end up writing about it. And, 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 uh, for some reason, if I didn't know the word, I would look up my emotion. I would look up with the thesaurus, one word after another, word after another, until I eventually found what it was I was trying to say. And, and uh, slowly, I became educated, and eventually, uh, I got my GED, because I realized I wanted to go to community college. To, I actually wanted to go to college, so I had to go to community college first to get my grades up. You know the story from that. And uh, when I was in, uh, uh, and then I started, uh, I thought I wanted to be an actor, but I really didn't. But there's, there's a job out there for the way your brain works, and for me it was writing and directing. As, as a director, I, I, as soon as I got behind the camera, I kind of realized what it is, the way my brain works. And I started writing uh, screenplays, because movies are very much like the way a brain works. It's about feelings, it's about thoughts, that it's about uh, actions, it's about all these different things that result in something by all the different things that you do. So I was doing this naturally by writing poetry, trying to figure out what it was I was trying to say, and film became a natural extension of that. And suddenly I felt, wow, I actually know what I'm meant to do, because I felt really comfortable in telling stories and really comfortable in making movies. Uh, I didn't get into making movies until I was 22 years old, and I've made a couple of shorts, a feature, and now I'm working on my second feature film now. And... Um, um, did I answer the question? Yeah, I probably did. Right? Yeah, it sets up a little background. It sets up some background. Um. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the next thing um, that happened, I think it was similar for both of us, is that, you know, we, we definitely knew this is what we wanted to do. Um, but, of course, we didn't have, we didn't get into the actual business so much later on. So what happens is, uh, hopefully you guys that are here in this media center now taking these classes and, and kind of learning the craft, will have a chance to start working in the industry at an earlier age, which means if you, if you hear of any productions that are going on, you know, try to get on as a, as a production assistant or intern under someone. Uh, we need to do extra work or stuff like that extra just to work. be around it. I used to do a lot of that just to be near it. I was that annoying actor that would stand near the camera, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. So in any capacity that you can try to shadow someone, which is what the term is called, uh, it'll benefit you greatly because of the fact that you'll be in there watching how it's done. And let's say, you, you know, you want to do makeup and you're working with, as an assistant to a makeup artist, you're, you're learning how it's done under various conditions, uh, you know, under different lighting styles and, and different effects. If you want to learn about lighting for film, you know, try to get into the camera department. Whatever it is that you want to do, as early as you can get in learning it, the better. Because I think the experience with us, we've, we've discovered early on that we wanted to do this, but we went doing other things for a long period of time, and we actually got into the business probably, you know, as, as, as well into our uh, adult lives, not, not as early as you guys are doing yeah, it, we although should. we had discovered it early. You know, I, I spent um, tw 12, 13 years uh, working in a theater group that I formed with a friend, even though I had gone and gone to some film school. So I felt, even though I felt, now I think back and I say, well, I should have just kept on with film. I would have been that much further along. I also, you know, everything makes you who you are, everything you do. So I, there's a lot of things that I'm doing now in film as a cinematographer or with set design, et cetera, that I realized came from also working in theater and, and learning to work with people and working with ensemble cast, which has kind of helped me 
work in film even in a different level that sometimes when you have someone who's working it just doesn't have that extended background so you bring all your life's experiences into what you do actually just just out of curiosity um, uh, what what is it that you guys uh, uh, want to do how many people here want to write are interested in the writing aspect of it directing you got a few directors yeah, camera people or cinematographers there. no cinematographers okay oh did I see a hand oh, I'm sorry love cinematographer uh, producers all right we got some money people back here uh, anything else I've missed makeup costumes makeup costumes does it seem like a daunting task to be get into movies because it's really to me I found out what was most amazing for me that it really isn't complicated it just it's a matter of the process of doing don't ever wish for anything you know what I mean just go out and start making it. I mean we're from the generation when video cameras first came out and you know before that we didn't know of the past right and suddenly we have a video camera and, and to be able to tell stories, it just comes down to doing it and, 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 and making it. And, and you know you're meant for it if, you, if it comes natural to you. My first films was the first time I started making something, I really, for the first time, knew what I wanted to do. And it came easy for me. Even if I was wrong and the films were terrible, which was true, uh, I kind of felt comfortable doing that. And, and, and let me tell you, that's one of those huge moments in time in someone's life. It's, it's bigger than great love, you know what I mean? Because it's one, when you find what it is that you want to do and, and you click and people are into what you're doing and, and, you're, and you're working at it, it's, it's fantastic. But see, film is one of those things where they say if there's two things you want to do and one of them is making movies, do the other thing because it takes all of your focus and all of your energy. And for me, I, make, I don't make movies for trying to please other people. I'm trying to, it's my own psychosis. I'm trying to understand life and my position in the world. So making movies allows me, allows for me, like those poems I used to make, to kind of put my life in perspective and kind of see it. So it came very, na I already did that anyway, and I bet you all do, because we're all in a movie. Every one of you guys. You guys just sitting there looking at me, and you're going, you have your own backstory to what I'm like like or what he might be like or while you're waiting in the waiting room you're just looking at that person go look at that lady I bet she's yeah and you have this whole story about what's going on do you, you know what I mean that's exactly a movie and it's just trying to find out the, you know the thing that puts all these scenes together that's that's what the core movie but all those as you're looking you have these these you have these uh, ideas of what that person is so it's like you just break them into shots you break them into, all right, that person looks like she's scared of being intimate. Well, that's a close-up, you know what I mean? Or, 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 or better yet, maybe it's a, it's a wide shot because she's detached, you know what I mean? So it's all types of feelings that, that come out in, in a very physical way. It's a very physical job because it's setting up cameras and the perspectives and all that other stuff. But it's about what you're thinking and what you're feeling. And the, and the film works very much like your brain. You're able to see all different, when you think of something or a memory, you, you see it from many different viewpoints. You see it from, from behind you, from over here. You see it from, oh my God, what my mother's going to think. You have that. You have all these different opinions to a single thought. Well, in film, you can actually capture all of that in some way. And that is making movies. And that's the art of making movies. And so I get a little wacky because I really love what I do. And, and, and if you guys ever felt like a little wacky in life because you see things from a different point of view, or maybe a little different from all your friends because you're always saying, look at that behavior. Doesn't she know or he knows if he does that, this, that, or the other thing's going to happen? Well, that's like writing a screenplay right there, just understanding behavior and all this stuff. So it really allows you in the process that after you're done making a movie, you've learned about yourself, you learned about the history of whatever it is you're talking about, you, you, you actually are smarter afterwards. So it's a wonderful way to do something that, that not for the money, and if you're ever good, really good at it, it will pay you, and you can just feel like you're answering, answering questions that we all naturally have anyway. So for me, that's what movies are. I don't want it to ever be this, this thing that you can't touch, this thing that seems like uh, you have to know somebody to get into it, because you know how you know somebody to get into it? You make stuff. And when you make stuff, that's how when him and I got to know each other. He, uh, I needed him. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he happened to be willing to work with me at the time. And, and now we're really dear friends. So that's how you get to know people, by doing and, and constantly asking these questions. Yeah, and one, one of the things that's interesting, I'm sure you're learning that here very quickly as you work on your own projects, is that you know, you, when, when you see a, a, a film on TV, in, in theater, on cable, on online now more and more, you know, you're going to see the end credits or at the beginning all the people that worked on a film. 
Now, you know, that's, what I, that's one of the things that I find the, mo the most interesting about working in film is that you're working with so many people. And depending on what capacity you're, you're, you're working on that project, people depend on you to get your end of it done. So for instance, I work a lot as a cinematographer, so I'll set up lights, give them colors, set up the camera based on, you know, what, what we're trying to convey because, you know, c c cinematography, film has a language of its own depending what, you, what you're trying to do. Uh, but, it's, but it's a collaborative medium. Yeah. And so, for instance, in working with Derek, um, I've worked with him on a couple of uh, films and in one, I was a, solely a producer and one other, another one that I worked with him, was, I was a DP, director of photography, cinematographer. And it was my, my responsibility to one, read the script, understand what it was that was on paper, but also working with him to understand what was his vision for what he wanted the film to be. Because it's one thing for it to be on paper, but then what is the artist also going to bring to it? You know, it may read a certain way on, on the script, but what is he bringing to it? You know, his ex what is his perspective? And you can have three different directors, and you give them that same scene. They go into three different rooms, and you videotape what it is that they hope to do with that scene. And if you splice those three little uh, bits together, you're going to see that they all probably had slightly different take. One may want a wide-angle lens so he can see the whole thing. Someone may just like want to go in for a close-up to capture the emotion. You know, someone may want the camera just static on a tripod without moving. Each indicating a totally different story and a totally different emotional Exactly. Well, he may have it on a steady cam, a brace that, you know, you put on your body so you can mount the camera and kind of go in for a shot, which, which would make a, a tracking or moving shot. And again, like you said, each one of those things makes it different. But what's interesting is about that is that no matter what position you're in, whether it's, uh, you know, makeup or a writer, you have to deal with everyone else because as a, as a, as a cinematographer, I have to figure out what the, what the director wants. I have to figure out from the producer what, what are my limitations for the budget. You know, how much money I have to spend for my crew, for the equipment, if we have special effects, you know, can we really do it? I mean, if you read something in a script, the first thing you do is do an analysis of the script and you do a breakdown. So you have to know, all right, well, they say, uh, you know, uh, the building is going to explode and collapse. Well, if you have a, a $50 million budget, you can do that. If you have a $100,000 budget, you, you can forget it. that. Yeah. The most you can do is that you're probably going to have an explosion in one apartment. Sound effect. You know, and, 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 and sound effects and probably have a shot where debris is coming down, which more or not is going to be people on a scaffolding throwing Throw it down. It so you have to adjust. You know, sometimes you, you get what you want, and sometimes you have you to be that, very creative. You just creator. figure out it. You just, if, if the shot is debris falling, it really is as simple. There's a bunch of guys coming on top of a ladder throwing things at your friends, you know what I mean, just to create it. It's not an intangible thing. Right. And then, uh, you know, the makeup person would have to know exactly what they're looking for. So, you know, does the scene re require that the person look beautiful or, or, or worn out, or in the case of debris is falling, I'm scarred up and, 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 um, and you know, and bloody. Uh, the production designer works very closely uh, with the director of photography, the director of photography, the director and the producers in making sure that everything that's happening on in location and costumes comes together, both in color. In a, if, you have a, if you have a film that's a period piece, let's say Civil War, the production designer is going to be tasked with doing the research to find out what the costumes of the period look like as authentically as possible and either trying to find those costumes as they exist and if not because they're very rare and they're not going to let you wear them just for the sake of a movie you have to make them from scratch so then that person has to make sure that they hire seamstress get the materials and everything and this is all part of the collaborative effort because you're it's all everybody working, working together you're always working off of somebody's a way they, like for instance actors, they, you may want an actor to act a certain way, but he doesn't quite do that. He does it this way. And so you're working off of what they do. So it's, it's, it's a collaborative effort all the way through from the writers to the actors to the seamstress to the, to even, hell, even the caterer because only the caterer knows how to make egg whites or something. And so we're all eating egg whites that day, you know. So uh, just sharing on the collaborative efforts even into the work is that you've always got what, what, what someone else has and you're working off of that. Yeah, and the most in interesting thing that's happening now, when Derek and I were coming up, I mean, they had the early <sighs> format of video, which was very clumsy, very heavy. It was normally a, a huge camera tethered to another videotape recorder, and it kind of took, you know, quite a few people to kind of run it effectively. Um, 
shots were done a lot differently because, I mean, if you're tethered to a, uh, to a deck, you're not going to be able to run and gun with it unless you're going to wear out the guy that's hauling the equipment. Uh, but one of the things that still that allowed when I was growing up, see, one of the things that, that, that I find interesting is that I grew up in the South Bronx. There was no money for me to go to a, a college where they were teaching film. I was fortunate enough that, you know, the Boys Club offered me a scholarship to take some courses at the School of Visual Arts. But, you know, nowadays with the technology is such that everything is digital and, you know, they have software that you can it's use accessible. at home, Final Cut Pro, cameras like the Canon X-01, which is being used in the back. You we know, couldn't which is, edit. You guys all have that available to you. Exactly. So you can more and more today make your own movies at the drop, a drop of a hat. I mean, even computers come loaded with, you know, iMovie and such, if you have a Mac, that basically allow you to put, you know, clip, digitize your clips, bring them into the computer, and assemble, assemble, assemble them in a way that's going to tell the story that you want. And if you don't like it when it's done, you can still reassemble it another way, edit it in a way that makes sense to you, or at least that vision that you want. You know, one of the things we discover that when we, when we go shoot something, we shoot it, as the script is written, and sometimes on, on set we have to make adjustments. You know, that's where the creative process comes in because you'll go and say, all right, we want this to happen today. And then we get to the location and something else is going on. It might see something that we didn't see before or something naturally happening with the way the light is happening at that moment, which gives the scene a whole different uh, effect, and we'll go with it. And when you get into editing later, you'll see things that worked or didn't work. We shot the sequence in a way that didn't make sense when we cut it, you know, or by cutting it a different way makes it more exciting, makes it f uh, move faster. And sometimes it's not words that make it happen. So there's a lot of stuff goes on in silence. Movie time is actually uh, a different pace of reality. It, uh, it is, is not reality. It's a, once you have a camera going, it's actually a slower of the time. And, and many times we throw out lines just because of that. Because you see things going on that's silent. You know, sometimes it's more interesting just to have that person go, now that on a close-up was huge, let me tell you. That little expression of your face, just having a judgment of somebody, uh, that it will capture the whole moment. See, film is the greatest art form ever to exist. You want to know why? Because it includes most of the senses. And at the same time, people have opinions about, you don't like country music, I bet. So you may not like classical music. Man. Well, movies, people are willing to kind of sit down and, 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 and you can get into the cortexes of their mind. They'll sit down. And I bet you I could play you a country song that you will get into, which when I have the right lighting, the right actors, and the right setup. Do you know what I mean? I bet you this, this symphony music that I can turn you on to with the right lighting, the right actors, the right setup, and all that other stuff. So it's, it's, you get really lucky because mass audiences are, are able to let you, they let you into your head, into their heads where unlike other mediums, you can't do that because we have sounds, we have music, we have uh, those being th three different things, uh, dialogue, or effects, and, and music, and then you have visuals, uh, shots, colors, and all that stuff that goes into that. So it's such a privilege to have this, 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 this chance to talk to people. So what you got to do is be really sincere about what you're wanting to say. Because if you're telling people the truth and you're showing them something they've never seen before, you could affect their lives for the rest of their lives. And unlike real estate business, that you got to find the right product, you got to be able to raise the money, you could make this shit up. You know what I mean? Out of, out of nowhere, making it up. I'm making, I'm making a movie this year with some big producers. I made it up. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Like, it didn't exist, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, people in real estate, the first word is real, is equity. Yeah, I agree with that. But it's amazing that you can make stuff up. It's on paper. It's suddenly equity because now we can buy and sell it, and it has a value, an intrinsic value. So it's, it's extremely exciting to have yourself self-empowered. You know what I mean? It's a way to self-empower yourself, Absolutely. especially since all the digital technology that's out there. We really, you know what I had to do to edit movies back in the day? Because, you know, editing machines used to be $150,000, and that wasn't even broadcast quality, so it would, like, be fuzzy looking. So I'd, like, find a guy, I would buy him food, kiss his ass, not literally, but, you know, trying to make him laugh, trying to be funny just so he stays focused on my work, where you guys, you know, uh, you could get an iMovie as soon as you get a, uh, a thing and cut that stuff together. And let me tell you, when you have the power, I could make you feel content, with a little bitterness. I can make you feel a very specific emotion. And, and when, you have, when you start being able to play with the tools of making films, with, which music and all that stuff goes into it, it is the most exciting thing on this planet. Now, let me ask you guys a question. What, what kind of films uh, are you guys uh, interested in? 
if anyone. What films have you seen either recently or films that you've seen that have been made in the past that just caught your attention now that you're taking this class? Scarface. Excuse me? Scarface. Scarface. Written by Oliver Stone. John Q. John Q. John Q. Interesting. Uh, Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Elephant Man, all that's right. Cool movie. I love Lynch. Love. The Graduate. Wow, yeah, that's, that's a classic. Cool. Now, now, now someone's cool, pulling out. Godfather. 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 Yeah. I understand. Yeah, so we got we got different genres of films. We have uh, you know dramatic gangster movie. We have we have actually two I Godfather. I'm glad you didn't hear Spider Man though or something <laughs> like that. You know? Which is a, which is another genre. Which is another genre. But and, and that's also the good thing about filmmaking is that you have various genres that you can work in depending on what you like the most. Um, if if you're a writer and you feel that you write you know better about the lighter side of life or the sarcastic life or right, of life or ironic side of life, you know, comedies. You can, you can write comedies. If, if you're writing uh, about, you know, everyday life and, and love and tragedy, you know, you can do dramas, uh, you know. And, and Imagine that. Imagine inventing people, and then they're actually talking to you. They're like, I, I've, I've written people, and they're like, why do I feel this way? Like, you don't like it? Let's erase it. You know what I mean? It's like you're God. You suddenly can create a, a world that didn't exist before. I, I get excited, so I get it. I have to interrupt him. No, that's quite a, that's, that's that's right. He's been working with me for a while, so he's used to it. Yeah, we know how to play <laughs> off each other. Actually, the first time we ever met, he gives me a call. Um, I, I, at the time, I was the president of this organization that, that has a chapter in the city. It's National Association of Latino Independent Producers, NALIT. And he must have seen my name on a website or something. And he calls me, and he says, "Oh, you know, my my name is uh, Derek Bellis Partridge, and I'm you know I'm I'm looking to shoot this short, which is a sample for a, a bigger script that I have, and I want you to produce it." And I'm like, "I don't know him from anything." <laughs> so I'm like saying, "Well, you know, let's talk about it more. If you f if you continue to follow up, we'll have a dialogue and we'll get to know each other, and hopefully we'll be working together." But I kind of thought, "All right, you know, I get a lot of calls of people that." Because they see your name somewhere, they think that, you know, they want to work with you. And it's, you know, they want something, either a contact or whatever, which is fine. Because that's what I was doing at Nalib, which really trying to get other, helping other people into the industry. But, you know, but when you just hear, you meet somebody on the phone for the first time, I mean, really, how much do you know about them? And how much do you really, you know, how much do you let your guard down? But he kept calling me, and he sends me the script. And then we start meeting, and, you know, and I think it was a, within a matter of a month, in April 1st of that year, we were already on set shooting the short, which I think he brought the, brought the clip. So it was one of those things where, because of the fact that I saw the energy in him uh, to do this, the passion to do this, and, and he had everything that I would expect, because he wanted me to produce the piece, everything that I needed to know and have from a producer standpoint, he had. He had the script. He had the, he had the money for it. So he even made my life easier because I didn't have to go out and raise the money. He really wanted me to be a, to produce a film from the capacity of coordinating everything, which is making sure that we got the crew, that we got the equipment on set, that we did the breakdown of the script so we knew what days we were going to group certain scenes with to make sense to, for it to cost less or also to make sense for the actors. Because one of the important things, again, is that when you're shooting something uh, I mean, when you got all the time in the world, it's one thing you can do it like I do sometimes with lower uh, budget films where we'll do it on weekends, over three or four weekends, because we know, you know, we're working or we're doing other things, but we take the weekends off to be able to do this film. But when you have a budget, you can say, all right, we're going to shoot the whole week straight just to get it over with or just because it makes sense. But another thing you have to take into consideration is when you start breaking down that script, it has to take everybody into consideration. It has to take when the actors are going to be available and when they aren't, and which actors you're going to bring on the set and which you aren't. Because if you're paying for everyone, you don't want, you know, if you have 30 actors, you don't want the 30 actors on set that day because you're paying all of them, right? You gotta and if you're own, and you got to feed them, you got to, you know, you got to make sure they're comfortable. And if you're only going to shoot a scene with two actors, why are you paying for 30 of them to be there? So all you that know? is organizational skills. Right. So you make sure that every day you're shooting, you only have the people there from whatever your entire crew and cast is, only the ones you need. If you have special effects, you better have that special effects person there ready to go with his, equip his or her equipment. Because if you have something that's going to blow up and all of a sudden you have everybody ready and there's nothing that's been set up for it to explode, or someone to make sure that it's happening safely, you've just wasted maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 for having everybody, nothing's going to happen. But it's asking the right questions and going through a checklist. It's really, you know, that's what it is. Right. And the way to get uh, uh, 
the way I see it, to get successful in life is there's, there's someone out there that needs what you have. And, and you, no one's going to ever do you a favor. There's no one in this world that's ever going to do you a favor. So what you do is you just keep doing. And then you find someone, because the way it works is someone needs what you have and you need what they have. And it's an exchange. The only way you get anywhere is by having an exchange with people and, and the collaborative effort. So uh, in my case, I saw a smart, organized uh, guy who knew everyone uh, in the terms of uh, how to crew everything, all that stuff up. So, and I had this film. So, uh, he and he likes doing what he d likes to do, and I like to do what I like to do. And being that I was, I met his requirements in terms of the things that he needed to have done to prove that it was worth his time. That's how the collaborative effort happens. It's I have to. We, no one's ever going to do me a favor, so I have to live up to what he does. And then you know what? He needed what I wanted. He wanted to produce movies. He wanted to get involved in making uh, uh, narrative things, which he was already doing at the time anyway. So it was just a, uh, that's how relationships are built. That's how everything is built. No one's ever, ever going to do you a favor. Yeah, and it was mutually beneficial because um, I was looking to get more stuff that I can say I produced, sure. more experience. Um, I knew that we were going to do something that was of high quality. You know, he, had, he already had a budget so we can rent better cameras, uh, and we knew that it was going to be edited professionally. Uh, we, you know, we were going to do a casting that was going to get good actors. And in the piece, one of the samples he has, you'll probably recognize some of these uh, actors from other stuff, uh, uh, from 16 Blocks, uh, from the Chappelle show. You know, these guys you've seen, but because we had uh, the budget in place, we were able to say, okay, now instead of just getting, you know, B actors or people that are just looking to break. Now we can go out and get people that do this for a living professionally and also live up to their expectations because there's all they also there's a way that they, their managers and their agents expected us to treat them as you know r rising talent. You know you fly them in, you put them in a hotel, you know you give them a per diem, you make sure they're fed, you make sure. Now, understand, I've already done a feature and have done other shorts in the past without any stars or anything like that. This was. Uh, uh, the second phase of my, my career where I wanted to show people that I am a pro and that I work with pros. Do not feel you have to hire professional actors that are, you know, at your, at your level at this point because it's all about making it. And, and once your level of work gets to a pro level, that's when you should start considering really pro actors because anybody pro, there's a reason why they're pro. They're good, you know. Edwin, there, can we take a question and answer? Sure. Do you want to show a clip? I sure. can certainly show a okay. clip. And then let's move up a clip. I just want to bring something up because mm -hmm. Derek brought, brought something uh, up that I think is very relevant to our class while we boot this up. Um, talk about this digital revolution we're in. And it wasn't around put, put, uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. We found two cats uh, that were born in our basement window cell the other day. And immediately my 10 and 14 year old grabbed my video camera, put it on time lapse. Did it a whole day in one minute, put it on YouTube, got 50 hits in one night from mm -hmm. the ASPCA to someone in New Zealand. What are you going to do? Looks great. And I'm going, wow, this is amazing. You know, you take a video of something outside your window, yeah. you put it on the internet, and the whole world gets to see it. And these are 10 and 14 year old students doing it. Similar to what you're doing now with your PSAs. It's a whole new world out there. Capturing time. And yeah. Absolutely. And you can get your project seen and made. Couldn't do that when we were young filmmakers. It took a lot of uh, money, collaboration. Some of my classmates that uh, you've, you've met through the speaker series literally went to film school to get use of that equipment. Yes, they got a great liberal arts education and met some great teachers, but they got that college ID card. <coughs> and got their $1 million liability policy, which you get with your ID card. As soon as you get it, you can take out your $300 camcorder and have the police department of the mayor's office work with you. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole new revolution in film school versus the independent world and the digital world. But it, it is a collaborative medium where everything goes around in a full circle. And I think it's wonderful that, that both of you in less than an hour can shed some light on how that collaboration works. You want to set this piece yeah, up? Yeah, I'd like to yeah. set it up real quick. This, I, I brought this one for two reasons. This is the one that Eddie and I, well, did, we both did uh, this other one as well. But uh, this is the one that we've been discussing and how we uh, built our relationship. And this is also the one that inspired the feature that I'm making now. The feature that I'm making now is called Gamecock. 
which refers to fighting birds. Not that there's, it's about birds. Uh, th this came about, just, just give you a little setup. It's a, there's two brothers in this scene, and uh, it was, it, there was an idea. My, 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 my abuelo used to say mala sangre, which means bad blood. And the idea was that you could have uh, someone marry into the family who's a complete bad person or at least lives badly so therefore treats people around him badly and that behavior can go into the child and continue on for generations and there's an actual idea called ancestral genetic memory that your forefathers experience are all inside of you so I decided to, to dramatize this because it, you know the reason why I thought of this idea because I'm looking at my own life I'm looking at my kids who have uh, uh, personalities that are, that are you know part of my uncles aunts and my wife's side of the family as well and so I dramatize this idea and say, okay, what if two people come in with a predisposition to be bad from all of the family's sins that go back for generations, let's say. And they are the crescendo of the, or the climax in their lives where they've realized they're the only two left. There's no grandmothers, there's no family, there's no children, no anything. So there's a hitman who's the bigger guy and a junkie who's the, uh, the younger brother. And uh, that sets it up enough, right? Yeah. I should do it. And if you have any questions, yeah, what? Right after we show the clip, we're gonna show it. Look at me, Greg. Look at me. You think I wanted this? The thing is, I didn't think at all. All oh, that death. Forget ignoring it. I was chasing it. It looks to me like you were too. Hey, you're That's just not. selfish. You think me killing you is gonna help? And fuck you. You will do this. No, I won't. Yes, you will. Your life has been nothing but a burden. Fuck it, let it go. Take mine. No! They already called it in. See now, if you don't do this, some scumbag I don't know will. Now that cell phone is gonna ring until it's done. Hey, take this envelope. It's got the keys. It's got everything you need, an address. Okay? All my stuff is there. Nobody knows about that place. Right? Just leave money in the landlord's mailbox. It has a lock. What the fuck are you saying? You giving me your life? There's money in the shoebox, in the closet. You take it. Let's just get the fuck out of here, man. Look, you said you wanted to see family. Here we are, man. Look, we're together, man. I'll go straight. I'll be solid, man. All my life was spent when I was young. What if I trip up, man? What if I take your shit and I use the money to fucking shoot up, man? Then this was a waste of time. You'll be dead soon and I'll see you in hell. We'll talk then. You probably got some juice down there, right? I probably do, so don't fuck with me. And this ain't gonna solve nothing. Take this! Put it in my heart. Put it in my chest and feel every bone break until you reach my heart and then take my blood and clean your hands of my sins and papi sins and live for mama and for Rosa who never had a chance and they'll be right there, right in front of your mind. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. Do it. Right. Release all my demons and turn them into angels. Just because you crawl through shit doesn't mean you can't come out clean. This can't be a bad way, Papa. Please, man, I need you. Do it! I need family close by, you. Not in this lifetime. Let's just get out of here. Let's just go. No, no, do it. Do it now. Take this knife and do it now! I can't! I'm not built like you! Your ten minutes are up. Do the right thing. We're brothers. Do it!
as steam. That's it. It's a romantic comedy. <laughs> Question and answers for Derek and Edward. All right, raise your hand and I'll pick it. How about that? Would that be easy? Say your first name. My name is Steve, and this is Edwin. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you like to create parallel world, world in your writing and cinematography? Well, I mean, there's, there's the world of reality and there's the world that doesn't exist that's made up in your mind. So when I'm creating, when I'm doing something in film, I'm trying to bridge those two things. So I'm trying to express something that for everyone else is reality, but it's coming from somewhere that I'm creating myself. I think uh, Derek pointed to that earlier when he says something that you bring to it. So when I say create, it's, it, it's nothing but a metaphor the way I wrote it, but it's really, it really means that I'm bridging those two worlds, the, the world that exists with the world that's purely in my mind, and how to bring that to a third element, which is something that then I can share with everyone else. So for instance, like Derek said, this was in his mind. When we met, he had just put this to paper. And by us meeting and, and putting crew together and getting the cinematographer, et cetera, we were able to then create this third thing, which became the product, the film. Really and, now, and now you can view it. You know? Even if we weren't here, you would know what the film is trying to say. It would mean a little, you know, it would be a little different to each of you based on your life experiences, what you bring to it. I mean, obviously, if you had a brother who had been killed or something like that, it would have a more powerful meaning if, if you hadn't. You know? So, it, it just, that, so that's, that's what I mean by that, just kind of bringing, bridging those two worlds. Come on, you all got it. You got this stuff. Come on. But it doesn't have to be. You feel there's something that was said. There you go. Sure. A real what family? Artsy. Family. Mm -hmm. It's a block. That's right up the block from where I live. Really? Miguel Algarín? Uh, oh, uh, he passed away, yeah. Yeah, I, know, I knew Pedro, yeah. Yeah, so I didn't realize like, um, how important he was until he passed away. And I started. Well, first of all, I'd like to talk about the word artsy. I hate there, that word. <laughs> did, uh, did, uh, was there anyone that inspired us uh, throughout the, uh, that got us into the work? Uh, the reason why I don't like the word artsy is because I always feel like it, it, we're always in the sub-basement, us artists. We're always in the basement, those guys over there in the corner, those freaky guys. In the, it kind of minimalizes us in some form. And I think that uh, uh, we're the ones that are giving back to the planet in a real big way. And, and it's by, by, by showing your own experience, there's a billion people out there, and there's four billion people. Is there four billion people on the planet, or six billion? I forget what it is. So there's uh, there's a billion people out there that will understand what you're trying to say. So therefore, you're creating a thought that that's uh, that just goes on. So it's not a frivolous thing. That's I hate that term. In terms of uh, uh, people that inspired me, my of just family, people that asked questions that I was curious by. You know what I mean? I've always been uh, curious by uh, big questions and trying to figure out my place. There were artists that inspired me, people like, uh, there's a guy named uh, John Cassavetes, who, uh, who he tells you there's enough art in human life and conditions, like, you know, a couple fighting who are in love. Uh, you shoot that like action, it feels like action. That's more exciting, more thrilling than a car chase, uh, you know, because it just is enough drama in real life. So artists like that inspired me, besides the first Rocky movie. Yeah. Which was a big deal. And actually, I think Derek is quite right when he says, you know, uh, artists, and I, w when we say artists, we don't mean just filmmakers, we mean painters, photographers, poets. And I think uh, in the case of Pedro, you know, he's like one of those examples that you can say who inspired a whole generation because there's a whole style of uh, what's called New Yorkian poets that have taken on that style that he and a few who started that in, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, has traveled around the world that style. And, and even when you see deaf poetry jam and all of that, all of that style of, of, of flowing with poetry comes out of that. That so you you know a poet, 
a painter, a photographer, a filmmaker can inspire generations of people in their own way. And sometimes you don't even realize it. Um, I mean, uh, my, my, my home situation was a little different. I grew up with my mother by myself. My father, actually, I found out after he passed away about seven years ago, six, seven years ago, that he was, early on, he was a filmmaker. And um, I got photos when he passed away with him with a camera and et cetera, which is really ironic. And he was also, he did uh, uh, advertising and photography for advertising, Rockefeller when they were running for governor, all those people, which is odd because the, the children that grew up with him, I had four other brothers from uh, another, from his side and a sister on my side. And on his side, none of his sons looked like him which is the oddest thing. I was born out of that relationship, and I look identical to him and also took up a lot of the things that he did in life, which I didn't know until much later. But at home living with my mother, my mother was a very practical person. She was wonderful. She was tough. But her, she wanted me to work and have a career in something that she knew would last a lifetime. It was my tenacity wanting to be an artist that kept me on this side of the fence. Um, I've been lucky enough the last couple of years that I've made a living from the art. Yeah, but you're also practical and artsy. Those both your genetics right there coming out. I've seen that. Well, yeah, but for many years it it, it was at it was at odds. So, yeah. for instance, I would you know there were times where I made the choices that I went through struggles because I wanted to do the art. Where I could have been more practical and say, okay, I can have a job that paid the bills and still do my art on the weekends or after I got to work. And I was so headstrong about just wanting to, be, to do my art that there were times where my whole day's meal consisted of coffee just to get me going, that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it, it just depends. But I was just hard-headed in that way. I could have been more practical. I'm practical in my craft, but I think when it came to my own approach at life, I was a little I'm more impractical because I was just one truck minded I mean, it's good and bad. It has its thing. So I think, for me, it was my own kind of will to want to do the art that kept me going. But I always trace back uh, my getting into the arts to Ernesto Lanzano back in the Boys Club, back in the dark room, because he was the one that his thing was. He it wasn't to him. It wasn't a photograph. It was art, and he showed me what the difference was. It wasn't a candid. It it, it, it was a photo, and it had its own value. And 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 my judgments, my choices in taking that picture is what made it art. And I learned that from him. So that, that, I think that's what kind of came forward and really always informed my, my art, or me becoming an artist. And those who have questions should ask them. I'll tell you why. Yeah. One second. Because being shy doesn't help you at all. Especially in this business. No, not at all. And, and I'm not talking about having a personality either. I'm talking about laying yourself out there. Because even if you fail, there's a lesson learned in that. And you, it's a good screenplay in that, too. You know what I mean? Uh, there's a, every, it's about you have the opportunity to get people to listen, do something with it. You know, ask that question, step out of it. Because there's, a, there's, a, you know, there's an old acting saying, dare to be great, you know what I mean? Because it, it takes guts to say, oh, here I am, look at me, and I'm gonna show you everything. That takes a lot of guts, and you know what? People looking at you when you do that, say that person's in their own power, that person's strong, that person has something together. So please, if you have any questions, please ask them. And you speak for that. Don't be shy to give attitude to the teacher. That's fine, you know. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I have um, just a question for you. Um, I come from a very diverse background. Uh, my family is Jewish, and I just want to know how you present yourself. Well, see, you know, I used to not categorize my movies. I would make films where, like, my wife would be a black chick, and my girlfriend was a blonde chick, and, and the guy was an Asian guy that I was fighting. And, and I, wouldn't com I wouldn't think of that as a, as, as a way to promote my films. I would think that, you know, what's the big deal? I'm a Greek Puerto Rican. My wife is German Irish, you know, so it's like I don't look at nationality. But the strange thing is, pe other people do. The whole world categorizes in genre and puts you in genres. And you know what? They're somewhat right to do it. You know why? Because like, like I pointed out before, he's also practical in certain ways and also artistic. We are a product of our environment. We are a product of our genetics. We're a product of everything that builds us. So I happen to be writing uh, Latino stories with a Greek tragedy. You know, a Greek tragedy, that's the product of what I am. You know, so I, 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 uh, I don't say I make ethnic films. I make films about New Yorkers. Uh, and they just happen to be all types of nationalities in them. Uh, 
but uh, let them influence you. Let them let the myths of your cultures come into your because we all have them. You're going to find that whatever nationality you have, that other nationalities have similar myths that go along with that. So definitely embrace that and learn about it because it's part of who you are and it will always feed you. Plus, your environment is going to give you your own stories. I mean. Uh, I grew up in the Bronx, and I mean, everybody around me was either uh, Puerto Rican, Latino, or African American. That was my growing up where I grew up. But, you know, there's all sorts of community, Asian community, Anglo, you know, African American, Latino. And from all those communities, there's so many stories uh, that, that, that you bring to it. You know, for instance, um, there's a film that I worked on, the guy Frank Reyes, who did Empire, you know. A lot of what he did was informed by the fact that he was in the South Bronx. That story probably could not have been told the way he told it if he lived in Connecticut. <laughs> That's not to mean that somebody in Connecticut can't make a film about the South Bronx and what it takes to kind of live and make a living as a drug dealer, but sometimes, you know, if you know every detail of what it takes to do that, you can better inform it. But that's not all, always the case, because a lot of people write about things outside of their environment. Yeah, Frank you know, Reyes' next film took place in Connecticut, remember? He was in Connecticut, Connecticut. Um, you know, uh, yeah. Five Feet and Rising, you know, yeah. Victor Vargas was done about kids in the Lower East Side who were Latino, but the guy who did it was white. And, he, and I thought that was one of the, the, the best depictions of that of a relationship, like a budding relationship in, in, in kind of an inner city that I've seen in a long time. But he did his homework and he felt for the community. He knew what it was about. He wasn't going in with judgments. He, he just treated it as a story that could have been anywhere. You know, it was just two kids falling in love in a particular community, in this case, the Lower East Side. Which is exciting about movies, because you could ask, you could go into a subject matter. Like, I, I wrote a film called Officer La Jara, which follows the Young Lord movement in 1969. And I'm able to really learn about that, because in the research of making a movie, you get to know shit. So you always come out smarter at the end of the process. You always end up smarter. I saw a hand go up in the back. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, the first is, do you necessarily have to to be a screenwriter. To be, or to be, you know, just to be a writer of the film. And the second question I have is, what, you know, you, you've had some affiliation with, affiliation with education. What, how, how might students use their education to propel themselves forward or to be inspired? What would you recommend majoring in? How would, how would they go about pursuing education? For me, uh, history. Uh, more knowledge, my brother has a statement which I love, I, I steal it, which is the one who knows more wins. And I definitely think that uh, all and every knowledge, and knowledge comes in every form, from tragedies to successes, consume, you know, poetry and all that other stuff. But be careful to try to do other people's work. Learn from those experiences. Let them become inside of you and all that stuff. About being an experienced writer, I was not an experienced writer, and not all film is about dialogue. So if you're not about dialogue and it's about physical action, because uh, don't forget, whatever you're going on inside your head, there's a physical action that equals that. We, most people don't say what they mean anyway. So uh, if you can understand the body language and their intents, you could just write about that. You don't necessarily, you could keep away from dialogue. This, this film was heavy dialogue, where this, this other one that I did, the dialogue means nothing, has nothing to do with the plot of the movie. And that was my goal, to make a movie that had, you had listened to the dialogue, it has nothing to do with the movie. But you totally get what the movie's about, uh, which is called Seeking Solace. So in terms of, uh, uh, but it is nice to find other people. That's where the whole collaborative thing comes into effect, is to find people that are writing and finding people that like to shoot their camera and finding people that like to be in front of the camera and collaborating with that. So you don't necessarily have to be good at, at everything. You just have to be good at one thing, which could just simply be behind the camera, could be simply producing, all that other stuff. You, uh, all, other, all departments have input. So. Uh, I don't think you necessarily have to be a writer, or there are producers, just to finish up on this, there are producers that aren't good at writing, but they can see other people's talent. That's their talent. So they can see a writer's work that is like, he's so close to the idea, and he can help, he can't write for crap, this, this producer, but he can get that writer to write by discussing and arguing with him what the idea is and all this stuff. So there's other ways to utilize your personal skills, use, utilizing other people's talent. As a director, that's what I do. Is util my talent, I believe, is utilizing other people's talents and recognizing them. Yeah, I think, um, be be just to, so I can get a, a, a little bit of that question, and I saw this hand in that one, is that, you know, one of, the, one of the, the most important things of anything that's on the screen is the writing 
because it's what comes first. It's, it's the genesis for what eventually is produced. But I think one of the things that I did when I was growing up, and I, and, and, and I, I similarly like, like, like Derek, I always wrote little notes and things, especially if I was out with my friends, I would come home and write little things, which I called a journal at that time. I wish I still had them, but they were thoughts. Like we played in an abandoned building because that's, that was our playground, whatever. And I would write about it uh, and make up little, little scenes. And I think that there are two things. One is being aware of your surroundings and, and always paying attention to things that people normally don't pay attention to, mannerisms, what people say, how people act, and begin to kind of write little, you know, scenes. And, you know, and there's two ways to do it. There's writing down what your observation is and then translating that into the format of a script because a, a, a screenplay has a particular format because after all it is kind of a blueprint for what everybody else is going to see and it's going to tell everybody what the, the actors, what the lines are, it's going to tell the director where the environment is, what, what, the, what the mood is, et cetera. So it's, it's, that's, that, that you can learn. You don't have to be a good writer to learn the format yeah. of a screenplay. But what I would say early on concentrate is being very aware of what's going on. You know, be observant. Yeah. Write things down. Write it in different ways. You know, I would say try to write a scene, pick a subject, write a scene, and then write it five different ways. You see, because you'll, you'll write it one way the first time, and then you'll say, mm, you know, because you always got to think about the reader in mind. You know, when you write a screenplay, the first person that's going to see it, you're, you're writing for a reader. You're trying to get their attention. Not only are you trying to put a story on paper, but you're trying to capture somebody's imagination. The, the thing that I've given uh, Derek some feedback back on is sometimes some of the dialogue. You know, maybe it needs to be cut back. But I think I've worked in groups where we've had like peer groups where we just you know we all write something we say we have two weeks to write something and we give ourselves a theme or we're writing all original work that we bring at that two-week point we bring let's say there's six of us we print six copies we distribute them and then we read them and then we all read them and then on a given day that person's work is going to be critiqued so let's say on a spe specific in my script is going to be critiqued or my story and we'll come back with you know kind of critique in the margins of questions or this doesn't make sense or this sounds corny and then you know when i see in a script this and i've been in these programs where i see that let's say uh, uh, one that i that i got actually the brio for which i thought was like really good and when i put it through one of these programs i saw that there was something that was missing and six of the seven people in the room had the same critique in the margins. It was just, how did they get from Puerto Rico to New York? You, I know they're on the plane, but you never kind of even say he's leaving. He's just there. Now, visually, that may happen if you, I mean, people are used to kind of seeing that, but I knew to go back to kind of create just one more half page where he's having a dialogue with his, with his mother, because his mother's very supportive. His father doesn't want him to leave because he wants him to work. In, in, in their ranch, in their property, and he's a, he's, he wants to go to New York and be an artist. But before that, all of a sudden, you know, he's, he's in Puerto Rico, they're going about their life, and it's like a period piece in the 40s, and all of a sudden, he's on a Pan Am plane headed to New York. And, and, I, and you know, to me, it, because I, I knew the story, I filled in the blanks. But sometimes when other people read your stuff, they'll say, well, this is great, but there's something missing here, or this doesn't make sense, or shouldn't these two things... And it's about asking yeah. questions. It's about really like, all right, how many people are in the room? All right, the mother, the father, the son, and the brother. What is a mother thinking? You may not write it, or you may write it down, it may not be included in the script, but you actually go, what is a mother thinking? And then what is the brother thinking? And you, and you just keep jumping around the room from different perspectives. And if you know these characters, you'll know where they're coming from. And all of that is what's, what's good. So don't ever think something's good because there's a car chase or because there's, uh, there, there's something. What keeps people interested is stimulating their brain constantly. Constant, it's, you're leading them down a path. It's like a joke. You notice a joke, they're always leading you this way, this way, this way, and then the, the answer is right here. All in front of your face the whole time. That's what a good, that's what a good screenplay or movie should do. It's, it's, as, as directors, we only say two plus two. Let the audience say four. And you know what? Well, sometimes you can put four and a half out of it, too, because there's, there's things that happen in the human condition that are interesting. So write about that. Show that. Like, it could just be like as he was talking. If you saw... It might have been the most interesting part of the scene. might have been a quick close-up of me going, I don't like what he said, but only in my eyes. And now all of a sudden, the whole scene means something completely different. Is this guy full of crap? Is this my full of shit? But for thinking that he's full of crap, you know? Like, all of a sudden, that's all stuff that makes a reader go, what's going on here? Well, I can't wait to turn the next page. Does he care? Does he not care? Who's the full of crap? All that stuff. So always remember, ask questions, and, and then 
in that process, you'll find the truths that come out. And also when you're writing, since you're writing, remember that uh, when movies are, you know, films are moving images. So you're describing your scenes as you were describing not only what's happening, but also images. Because people have to, in, that are reading the script, have to imagine where they are, what's taking place. And they're throwing their own stuff how, onto how do, that. How do people uh, feel? And, and mostly in the dialogue, you'll get also how they are reacting in their environment. But one thing that's very important is he said, know what's the backstory to what's about to go on. Even if it's not in the script entirely, it helps you kind of envision what may just have happened that had that person react a certain way in that particular scene. And one of the things that I hear a lot of really experienced uh, screenwriters, and I went to a screenwriting conference last June um, out on the West Coast, was in many of the workshops that I attended, they always said, always start the scene at the last possible moment. Which means, you know, if, 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 if they're about to have lunch, do you want to show them leaving the office, going to, 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 the, to the diner, buying the lunch? They might already be at lunch, already starting, already in the middle of a conversation. You pick it up at a point where you really want to get to the part that's the most important. They might already be having lunch, and you just start there instead of showing them through the whole process. Films aren't told in real time. If you see anything that's told in real time, it's going to bore you to death. Whoa. Because if you ever heard, I mean, we think we're exciting, but if you ever heard, even this, once they review this tape, we probably think we sound so eloquent, we're going we're gonna to play this back and we're going to say, why did I say that? And why did I take so long to get to the point? That's how we are in life, because we like, you know, it's just a, a, a stream of consciousness that we, we have with people. But in film, you have to be tight. It has to make sense. Everything film time has to is be a perfect. Lot slower. It's a lot slower. Like, so many times I've written lines, and it's like, what do you, you know, I don't like you, I think you're ugly, I think you're this. And all I needed was the quick close-up of her going like this. No. And not only that, when you think about a film. three minutes. A film, a hundred and you know, 120 pages. Wow, that's a lot to a do. A minute a page is how we think but about it. A minute a page. But when you think about that, you have to tell this diverse, complex story in 120 pages. All of a sudden, you're saying, wow, that ain't enough time. That ain't enough pages. It does when you're starting, but when you have to get it all in there, all of a sudden, you're finding yourself, my god, let me go back. And this that took a page and a half, let me condense it to just a third of a page. I mean, uh, and, and, and some people use that to effect. I mean, somebody, Pulp Fiction. That you know the, the 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 kind of snappy dialogue that they were having back and forth, which at that time kind of like made people kind of oh Quentin's a genius and all that. But if you go back and you listen to that dialogue, it is banter, but everything that they're saying is revealing something about them, you know, about the way they are and how different they are. Even though they're a team and they go out and they do these hits, they're very different people. And the way and if you listen, to, if you go back and listen to their dialogue, you start getting a sense. Oh, well the Travolta character is this way. And the other guy is this way. And you can see it in what they're saying and how they're reacting to each other. So even though it just seems like this long conversation that they're having in a car or these moments that are just like kind of bickering with each other, it's, it's revealing character. And it's also moving the story forward. And that's why you should study, going back to what you should learn, is study everything from sociology, which is the behavior of people, to the history of people, to color. How does color affect you? How does structure affect you? How did light affect you? So you literally can learn about everything. And there's, you know, there's a great line in a movie called Grand Canyon. Steve Martin says, where he plays series, he goes, you know, that's your problem. You don't watch enough movies. Because if you watch enough movies, every question of mankind has been asked. And, and that's what's great about making movies, because you really, Learn about everything. I guarantee you, this movie. a frog living in the the Everglades. How it only breeds with a certain kind of frog. I will use that information to affect an actor. I'll use that information to to describe something to my DP. I'm like, you know how the frog does this thing, and so it's like everything you could possibly ever learn. It's so exciting because there's a way to use it, and you yeah. don't waste any of your time by learning. That's exciting. The other, the, other, the, the I just want to add something before we go. Yeah, I just want to add one thing, and I'll end it there with, with, with this point. But one of the things that I do, and I did it before you had to go out and buy them in the East Village, whatever, $15 for a script. You can find them as PDFs online now, hundreds of them. You just Google any movie you want on these sites, script. Uh, there's, I forget the names of the site, but there's about five sites you can get them. And you can, I have CDs, 230 scripts. Almost every script you can imagine in different categories, comedy, drama, horror. If there's a, a specific type of movie that you like, download all the horror movies or comedies and learn how people make movies go forward by writing them. And you, you get a better sense of how to, 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 to learn. Um, 
everyone. No, you mean in film or yeah. in, in trajectory? I, I, I just watched that and I had my whole heart melting into uh, no, every every time you make something, you are much better than the thing you just made. And what sucks is everyone thinks that that's what you do. Because the process of making it, you, you, it's all problem solving and obstacles that you're coming across. So you're watching the result of me solving many problems to get this thought out, and it doesn't represent at all what I do because I'm better than everything that I've just completed. So yeah, every single one. I think my thing, it's, it's not related to film because I, I, I love what I'm doing, but I think, again, I'll go back to when I had the opportunity when I was in the boys clubs. I took uh, two courses during that time. And, when I, and every time I finished a course, the boys club said, well, you know, we're willing to pay for the next course. Because it was by course. It wasn't like a full college uh, program. And my mistake was that I got to the point where, you know, I wanted to spend more time with my friends and I felt I was losing something because it was summer or whatever, and I wanted to be with my friends. That was a mistake. Having known what I know now, then, as 17, 18, I should have took every course they wanted. And, uh, you know, I could have yeah. probably got my whole education paid for up front by the boys clubs. And I kind of, you know, my brain was such that I was more interested in hanging out with my friends. So I think that, you know, that, that's one of the things that I always think back, wow, I really would have been that much more ahead sooner had I probably I gone through. I wish I knew your age yeah. exactly what to do. I would have yeah. done a lot more. Yeah. Um, um, for both of you, how do you guys uh, choose your actors when you're, when you're about to do like a movie or a film? Like with you with uh, Bronx is Burning, um, the three main characters, like George Steinbrenner, the manager, and um, uh, the baseball well, the, the, well, there's two things. I'm working on a documentary called Bronx Burning. The, the Bronx is Burning is an ESPN uh, miniseries. No, I'll, I'll explain the difference. Because I, I, I work in narrative film, and Derek and I have worked a lot in narrative film, but I also do documentaries. And Bronx Burning is a documentary. So that's going to have real people playing themselves. It just, it's going to be everyday life stuff. And it's looking back at who burnt the Bronx versus the ESPN series, which is about the 1977 Yankees. No, it's, uh, it's, it's you know, I get, I'm getting the call every day, people saying, I see, you, I see your, your, your film is done, and I'm like, no, no, I'm working on a documentary. <laughs> That's a mini-series, a narrative mini-series, but it's actually helping me out because on IMDb, which is the Internet Movie Database, which imdb.com, you should go, you get to see the credits of people and the films they work with. I think in my bio I added both of our IMDb credits because you can see credits online. Um, because of the fact, the more people go see your credits and visit your, your, your credits online, the more your, your people meter goes down, one being the best, of course. Um, and because people are, uh, are mistaking my documentary for the miniseries, my people meter in the last couple of weeks has gone down. I mean, really, Jesus but that's good for me good. because p people that may want to invest in a project say, well, wow, people are interested, and it might be just a byproduct of getting fumes from the miniseries. So it's... Just to answer that question about choosing actors, actors uh, come in with, we hire them by their innate personality. Very few people actually get paid to act. So if you could just be yourself comfortably and relax on film, that's what we're looking for. So uh, we hire actors by flavor. Like a certain character, has a, that's the way I describe it, has a color tone or flavor to me. And I mean that emotional t color tones. So I look for people that have similar color tones that I'm looking for, emotional t tones that I'm looking for. And it's never 100%. You work with what you got. Right. And from a producer standpoint, I mean, hopefully the director that's hired to direct the film, you trust them enough to make those decisions. But the, the producer may, at one point or another, if they feel that the choice is so bad <laughs> for the role, that they may come in and say, you know, why don't you reconsider? Yeah. Or, or say, you know, the film isn't getting made with that person in the lead. And when you get the pros, the stars and all that stuff start being a whole different element to how to choose an actor. So there's a, a, a fine thing. line between art and commerce. Yeah. And this story is so similar to when Richard Brick talked about why Chris Rock didn't get the role in Angle with the Angle on Boys. Joe Basquiat did not want Chris Rock. And you could, you could be the greatest guy in the world. You're just wrong. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Uh, in both of your careers, what was the biggest obstacles you had to overcome? My career in general. <laughs> 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 no, just, just kind of getting to the point where you feel like you're doing what you want to do and doing your thing right because there's a big difference i mean 
uh, I started getting, I started being on the periphery of what I wanted to do early on through the boys clubs and getting on people's projects, but I always felt that my creative voice wasn't there, so I always felt, all right, it's a collaborative medium, but when is my voice going to get into the project? So it was easy enough to start doing my own projects or working with people who I felt I could be equally creative on. But there's, there's something that happens. It's weird. We all start out looking at other people's work. Every artist on the planet, everyone, maybe not Mozart, I don't know, he's that first draft guy that could just be amazing, but every artist pretty much is looking at other people's work and we're being influenced by it, we're shaping ourselves. It, I didn't get into what I do, meaning I'm not making anybody else's movies anymore. I'm making my perspective, my point of view, my stuff. Uh, and then that, to me, is when I finally became a true artist, when I do what I do. And if, yeah, you might see some Stanley Kubrick in there. You might see some Cassavetes. You might see some Scorsese. You might see a lot of those influences, but I'm not doing it because I saw it in somebody else's movies. It's already, the influence is already inside of me. So the hardest part is allowing yourself to grow and making mistakes along the way and allowing yourself to say, you, you know, everyone thinks I sucked at a writer. Everyone thinks I sucked at this and sucked at everyone. I, I, I'm the only one that believed. And, and, and you know what? It took about 10 years. And now, you know, now people are giving me money. Now people are backing me up because it took me 10 years to get good. It's 10 years until the, my rhetoric and my skill combined. I, used, I had this much passion when I was 22, but I had no skill. So it took a lot of years to live through the pain of sucking to, to suddenly figure out what you do. Yeah. Sucking sucks, man. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> But, but there's think, something that drives you if you feel like you're meant to do this. It's a feeling inside your chest and your solar plexus, and either it's calm or it's not. And you'll know. You can listen to it. You can hear it. It's a tone. And let me tell you, that's, that's faith. And, and, and I think, you know, that's exactly what I said earlier. You know, I went through all these kind of hardships because people didn't believe in what I was doing was going to become anything. I was the only one that believed yeah. it and kept at it until it actually started happening the way I wanted to. But it's really about believing in what you want to do and just... You know, I mean, be a little more practical than I was. If you have to get the, the job to pay the bills yeah. or to pay for your education while you're doing what you want to do, balance it out, but always go keep forward. Doing, keep, keep doing, doing it. Because every time you get better. I just wanted to close. Um, the students are keeping journals on these visits, and I'm going to be sending you some of their journals. Oh, that's great. One of the things that's, that's come out in all the journals is, uh, especially in the last visit, that every guest that has been here, and this is from the students, each have a passion for what they do, whether it's cinematography, producing, directing, writing, composing. And I think today um, you obviously have another opportunity to meet and listen to two young men who are in the business who have the same passion. So a round of applause. <laughs> now, so before you leave, we have a tradition in this College Now Speaker Series to take a group picture with oh, the class. Would you guys stay right here? That's